council, am I on? Council members, you will have time to read, we will give you a little time to read some of the materials that you got before we do the voting. Um, so please don't, while the committee chairmen are giving their reports, you can't hear me? I'm talking as close as I can get. Um, because the mics face that way so the people up here can't hear very well. And you know they're working on that system. They're going to spend a lot of money trying to do the system. So, so anyway, please don't read during the committee reports because we will. I'll give you a little time when we get to those um, those papers. Okay, and it's time to open our meeting. Good morning. Welcome to our October uh, resident council meeting. And we will start with approval of the minutes. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Thank you. Do I have a second to approve the minutes? Thank you. The minutes have been, it has been moved and seconded that we accept the minutes. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Any additions? Um, all those in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. The, mo the motion is carried. The minutes will be accepted. And our treasurer is here. Are you, did you have a chance to catch your breath? <laughs> uh, Katie has our report. Our opening balance was 1,200 and, oh dear, 56.47. We wrote one check for $9.13 as reimbursement to one of the committees who had some fees to be reimbursed. And I didn't do the math on that on the balance. So our balance at this point is 1,240 five dollars and 47 cents. Thank you. That, that is projected on them. Okay. Um, we usually start with administration, but they don't believe we start on time, I don't think. So they don't get here. <laughs> so we will start with our with our other committee reports, and when they show up, we'll let them uh, start. Um, I have had a request. Oh, here they come anyway. Uh, so we'll let them speak, and um, I'll talk about the rest of it in a minute. Sorry about that. We were in a meeting and uh, time slipped away. Um, I'm going to go ahead and report on sales activity for the month of October, which is not quite over, but uh, getting close. Right now we have eight sales on the board, of which seven are specific to our new apartments in the 40 apartment building. Uh, and we had one sale that was a cottage. Uh, as far as moving activity, had three move-ins, uh, two of which were into uh, Main Street apartments and one was into a cottage. So that is good. We are right now at 38 of 40 apartments sold on the new oh, apartment wow. building. So yes, cool. unbelievable. Um, we uh, have closed the uh, bond financing yesterday morning at 8.30. That was official. Um, pretty exciting opportunity for the village. Um, we w uh, were looking to sell generally about $35 million worth of bonds, and uh, it's almost like a poker game. You never know really uh, how things are looking. All of the institutional level investors uh, are telling you all the, all the while that uh, uh, there's a lot of risk there, and uh, they, of course, want to uh, be paid for that risk. And uh, when it came time to price, all nine institutional uh, investors wanted all 35 million. So that is called being nine times oversubscribed. Uh, when you're oversubscribed to that level, you bring the interest rates down and you find out how many people are still interested and they were able to bring it down and bring it down uh, to the point where it saved us right around $2 million organizationally, the premium that we would have to pay for those bonds. So uh, our debt, um, looked very good and uh, that was proven through the oversubscription and uh, we right now just may have the lowest interest rate on 
unrated debt, I think, in the history of municipal bond financing. So we are uh, hit the market at a right time. Uh, kudos to the team that helped make that happen. Uh, we effectively uh, shoved about 90 days worth of work into about 30 days to get that to market on time. So it was uh, no small effort. There was a lot of folks involved, and uh, it was a true team effort to uh, get it to where it was, but uh, highly successful bond financing that is officially closed. Um, we continue to work on what it takes to get ready for this construction project. Uh, parking is a big deal. Obviously, I think we all know that. We have a lot of residents who are ultimately getting displaced uh, from the what will be the construction site. Uh, Matt Roder and his team in Environmental Services held meetings yesterday uh, with uh, residents, broke up into three different groups. And uh, I spoke to people in all three, including the, uh, the last group to meet, and uh, seemed to be very um, pleasant with uh, how we were able to accommodate their, their change in parking. So that is positive and much appreciated. I think we all know how lucky we are to have uh, such wonderful residents here who, who really do work with us uh, hand in hand. It's not like that everywhere. Uh, we are aware of that. We value that. It is very important to us and we appreciate it tremendously. So your understanding and uh, flexibility and appreciation for the greater good is, uh, is, is something that uh, is, is amazing that we have here at Friendship Village and part of our culture. Um, we held a meeting for the folks who we uh, affectionately refer to as living in harm's way or the danger zone. Um, those folks that would be in where phase two currently is. Phase one, of course, involves no demolition. Phase two would involve uh, taking 60 apartments down. As I've said, we will not do that until everybody is out of that building. Um, and that <laughs> remains the plan. Uh, but we are putting a plan together to start working on getting those folks uh, moved out. We are looking at our guest apartments as being available apartments for people to leave the danger zone and, and move into those, as well as new apartments that open up as residents that live outside of phase two, either go to possibly Nunning Camp, go to the health center, or pass away. That attrition activity is where we will be moving people out of uh, what is phase two and further into the courtyard apartments. Uh, that is a plan that uh, we will just continue to uh, monitor and, uh, and work closely with those folks that are involved. And again, a uh, very understanding group, very positive group, and we are going to work uh, closely with them to make sure that that goes as well as it possibly could. Uh, we do not have a date on uh, the start of construction yet. Um, we are still uh, working with the city of Tempe on some final permitting uh, hurdles that uh, they have out there for us, and uh, we, we expected those and are working through those. Um, our community garden is moving through the uh, city of Tempe uh, city council uh, hoops. Uh, they cleared the first hoop here in uh, Late October, there is one final one in November, which we don't anticipate any issues uh, with doing so, but uh, continuing to work through that. Uh, with that said, the city of Tempe has invited us to uh, be uh, 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 participate in their grand reopening of Earhart Park, the construction that they did on the um, children's playground and, and just that whole area is uh, gonna be opening up, I believe it's uh, November 16th, which is a Saturday. So I plan on going down there and seeing that and being a part of that. But uh, for you folks who have young grandchildren, what a, a wonderful, lovely place to uh, be able to take them now. It's a whole other world down there, and uh, it's exciting. Uh, Emily, Jadine, and I will be in San Diego uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, returning uh, back to the Valley on Wednesday um, for the annual Leading Age National Conference that's held out there. It's an opportunity to uh, go out and interact with our peers. Uh, Life Care Services hosts a reception, and then there are a lot of ongoing continuing education opportunities, classes basically all day long uh, that we're able to go out there and find out what's, uh, what's happening in our world. And then last but not least, our 2020 budget. Uh, we are trying to uh, wrap that up. We met with our uh, Board of Directors Finance Committee meet, uh, last night. And uh, we'll be setting up a meeting with our residence council uh, finance committee here, uh, targeting, I think, next Friday, possibly, um, to see if that will work for the joint meeting that we tend to have and in anticipation of having the budget approved at our Tuesday board meeting. 
uh, and then presenting it to you at our Thursday village meeting, not this coming week, but the week following. So that is where we're at. Um, definitely the, uh, the minimum wage increase has uh, had a profound impact on the 2020 budget. Uh, and then the subsequent compression that happens when you have these artificial mandated increases in wages. So we're working our way through that, and it uh, has made our jobs much more challenging and difficult, but uh, ultimately, uh, hopefully, we'll uh, be able to get it figured out and keep that monthly service fee increase uh, right uh, just below 4%. So that is our goal. That's my presentation. Okay. Uh, council members, are there any questions? Uh, well, you don't have to hold your button down. The rest of you, if you have questions, be sure you remember to hold the button down on your microphone. I have just a couple questions. We're going from 60 apartments to 48, so we're actually losing some in the, the process of the new building? No. So what really what we'll be doing is, is effectively adding 40 new apartments with the first building being built. Once that building is built and uh, people were moving into it, assuming we have had an opportunity for everyone to be who is in phase two, which is a, a current existing building, assuming everyone has been able to be reaccommodated into the courtyard apartments, at that point in time, yes, we would demo those 60 apartments. Okay. Um, the second question I had was, what is the time limit on the new building once the permits are in place? How long will we be under construction with that? Yeah, we are being told that this project is an 18-month construction project. So from start to finish, uh, 18 months is what we are being told. Uh, I do not believe it. Um, <laughs> I so really don't. Uh, I would say, in all honesty, uh, at best 20 months and uh, possibly up to 24 months. Uh, the, uh, there is a, uh, a clause in a contract which uh, does put skin in the game for the uh, general contractor. So if they do fail to meet their uh, deadlines, uh, there is financial consequences to them. So I can tell you that our, our goals are aligned to get it done quicker and sooner than uh, what it is. And maybe they will deliver. Maybe I'll be shocked, but I'm being told 18 months. Two more questions. How many leases do we have in the apartments and in Mm -hmm. The first one yep. to come down in so harm's the, way. Yeah. So the all in all, the whole we only leased in the courtyard apartments. We no longer lease whatsoever. Uh, all in all, I will tell you that we have in and around 40 people that are here living in the village under a lease agreement. Uh, as far as the folks that are in uh, the, the danger zone or harm's way, um, it's less than 20. 19. My last question is the main gate uh -huh. during construction. Yep. Will it remain open? Yes. For all intents and purposes, the main gate will remain open. Um, there is going to be some time, and it will be well communicated, where we are going to have to shut down that front gate uh, for a couple weeks. Uh, there will be digging and trenching and all of that type of activity that is necessary. Uh, for the project, so we uh, our goal is to leave that open as much as possible to minimize the disruption to residents. But we know for a fact there will be a couple weeks at least that we will have to shut it down. But it'll be well communicated, and uh, we will direct people out the evergreen gate. Thank you. Yes. Are the, um, Kathleen, we be sure and hold the button down the whole time. Uh, Cole, the garage building is yes, how long, time-wise? Uh, you know, it, I, I don't know, Kathleen, but I think I know where you're headed as far as building the garage that which the building will then be built on top of. Um, of course, the garage will be finished effectively uh, before you start building the building. Yeah. However, it would not be available for parking until the entire project is completed. Well, that's first. Uh -huh. Timeline on that. Mm -hmm. Is what about? You know, I, let's say a couple months. Oh, and then on that top of that is the the high other rise. yeah another all in twenty all, months, eighteen months to twenty months. Yes. So you're talking about year and a half, almost two years. I would say two years before the harm's way people are impacted. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Are there any other questions from the council? 
Are there any questions from our audience? Uh, he's coming with the mic, Ed. Cole, what can you tell us about the traffic pattern after that new building is completed? Will there be parking spaces along Southern Avenue there? And will there be a roadway still going that along there? There will definitely be a roadway um, going there. So the people that live in the new building, the new 40 apartment building, uh, would effectively come in off of Southern Avenue through our main gate, make that hard left as you do now, uh, travel towards the canal, make that hard right where you turn now for the canal, uh, and then you would travel kind of back down in the way they've had to build the parking garage entrance to that 40 apartment building. Will there still be parking spaces along Southern Avenue? I think there will be some, but not as many as there are because of where the, how close the building is effectively going to be towards Southern Avenue. It's going to uh, eliminate uh, uh, several of those parking spots. So during that time, we one of the things we're going to be doing is we have a relationship with the uh, Resurrection Church across the street. We are going to have all of our employees parking over in Resurrection Church's parking lot, and we will be offering some shuttle surface to employees during those high peak times where we have large amounts of people coming on in the morning, going back on the afternoon, new people coming in in the afternoon, and people going home in the evening. So that's just another thing that we're working on in the background. But the only way we would be able to accommodate the residents who are being displaced by the construction project specific to parking is for all of our employees to be parking across the street. So, Thank you, Cole. We have one more question. Mm -hmm. Bob? Bob? Uh, Cole, um, I remember seeing a master plan uh, that I think was 340 uh, uh, apartment buildings. Uh, does the 35 million uh, bond issue cover just phase one? Yeah, that's a good question. It, the numbers you referenced aren't exactly right, Bob, on the number of apartment buildings, but there is a multiple phase project. Uh, phase one, of course, is what we're talking about now. Those are the 40 apartments. Phase two is as far as we've gotten beyond phase one, and that would be 60 additional apartments. We're, we'll have to wait and see what three, four, five, and six in terms of phases look like. Um, back to your question is, will the $35 million only fund phase one? Uh, the answer is sort of. Uh, what we will do is we will, of course, collect those 40 entrance fees. So we're going to have to shut. It's just like you know building a hotel. You're going to shell out the money up front to build the building. On the back end, you're going to sell those entry fees for those 40 apartments and how much you collect on those, let's say that's uh, 25 million. We will retain the, that 25 million of those entrance fees that we collected and our goal was to not have to go back and get a major bond issue to do phase two. We would like to simply take that money and roll it into phase two and keep it moving in that way. Well, those are all good questions. Are there any other questions? Cole. Oh, we have another one. Yeah, Cole, what did the bonds price on that? So, come again? You. He's in the audience. Oh, right here. Ah. What did the bonds price on that? They, uh, it depends how you look at it. Um, and uh, it, it's under 5%. It's between 4 and 5% um, all in. You have a de several different ways you can look at the interest rates. You have certain interest rates up for the first 10 years. Um, and then you have this true all-in cost. That they call it the tick. Um, and that's right around 4.6, I think, percent. So, yeah, we, uh, like I said, we, we got them for unrated debt. Uh, we, I believe, right now have uh, the cheapest unrated debt that has been purchased uh, by uh, a senior living organization through the municipal bond uh, financing. Are there any other questions? I don't see any. Uh, thank you, Cole. Okay, thank you. Emily, you don't have, do you have anything to say? No, okay, we're glad you came though. <laughs> thank you, Cole. All right, we'll see you all later, thank you. Mm -hmm.
we're going out of order on the agenda a little bit because Ron Newt has to be somewhere, and so we're going to let the Welcome Coffee Committee uh, report first. Thank you, Mr. Ch uh, Chairman and uh, Council members. Um, I have a water aerobics class at 10 o'clock, and that's why I'm going in early. Uh, the Welcome Committee has been active hosting new residents, providing publicity for the Welcome Coffee, examining the new <coughs> resident packets for quality and content and upgrading as necessary, and preparing the decorations and program for the Welcome Coffee. The October uh, 2019 Welcome Coffee introduced three new residents to the community. They were Lola Peterson, Rosemary Anderson, and Sylvia Huey. And if you see any of these people wandering around, give them a hello. Our program was presented by our resident, Mike Ivanich, entitled, And Now for Something Different, and it was, a very amusing history of the cartoon characters Rocky and Bullwinkle. Our next welcome coffee will be held on November 21st when our social services director, Susan Lalo, will talk to us. That's it. Thank you, Ron. Are there any questions by the council? Do we have any questions from our audience? Thank you, Ron. Okay. Go, swim hard, <laughs> or whatever. Um, then we are going to start back at the beginning, so we will start with Grace of the Activities Committee. Someone told me I should say last names. Grace Womack. October, <clears throat> excuse me, October 31st is the Haunted Hol Hol Hollywood Halloween Party at the Rec Center, and we ask you to please sign under H in the special books if you are planning to attend. And there is going to be a pet vendor affair um, well, it is scheduled for November 9th. You'll have to look in the villager for more details. The Veterans Luncheon is November 11th. Oh, and the, I forgot to say, the Pancake Breakfast is November 5th. And for November, there are going to be additional concerts on Saturday, or one on Saturday and another one on Sunday. And regarding entertainment for the hearing impaired, Connie is researching and looking for acts. And Connie will be on vacation November 25th to December 2nd. Sounds like a busy month coming up. Uh, are there any questions from the council about activities? Uh, any from the, uh, from the audience? Thank you, Grace. Um, Ed Kearns will give our communications report now. Can you hear me? Is it better now? Okay. In the communications committee meeting, Paul was asked again about telecall reception in SCRM. Although dropouts or dead zones have been reported, he did a test of the telecall unit using a telex receiver listening device. He found no bad spots either inside or outside of the SCRM. He said that the issue may not be with the loop, but maybe with the individuals listening in, which is not blaming them because I'll continue. There are many variables that can affect the audio quality with one's hearing aid. First and foremost, the quality of the hearing aid itself can be a factor. Just like any other electronic device, there are a wide range of types, manufacturers, and quality. And uh, I spoke to uh, Dr. Venkatesh about this, and she said, the only way you would know if your hearing aid is working properly with the telecall unit is to ask your a vendor to check it out to make sure that it's working properly. So other causes of static and dropouts can simply be misuse of the device by the owner, uh, over adjusting the volume to create distortion, or the amount of individuals using the loop at the same time. You didn't really have a way of testing if you have 12 people using it, whether it affects the problem. 
When he tested the loop, he was the only person connected. Multiple hearing aids drawing from the same feed might be causing trouble. Now, we haven't heard whether there are only one or two people who have had problems with this or 12 or 20. So if further work is needed to be done, people would need to report that and have Paul do some more tests. Paul was asked about closed captions in the skirm. He reported that there are 15 individual users that have connected at some point. I have no idea how many are connected now. I'm looking at what's going on right now on my cell phone, and uh, it's working very well. I asked about the Information Technology Help Desk, extension 4444. Bob Auer said that this, this is working again. Travis will write up a reminder of this service for the villager and will add a slide to channel 1960. And I want to mention that the um, uh, iPhone class is going to be starting in uh, November 5 and 7 and 21. And if you are interested in that, you'll need to sign up on the sign-up sheet under I. Okay. Thank you, Ed. Are there any questions from the council? Are there any questions from the audience? And I will mention, now that you bring up communications, the mic that's hanging in front of the screen is stuck. There's nothing they can do about it. It's not because someone forgot to raise it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Um, our next uh, committee chairman is Marty Whalen, and he will talk about constitution and bylaws and all that good stuff. Thank you very much, Mary. I'll try to find a lot of good stuff. <laughs> it's hard to find in constitutional bylaws, by the way. Doris, can you hear me? Doris, can you hear me? My voice is about three octaves below your hearing register, I think. Uh, get, can you get hear us, me now? Get as close to the mic as you can, Marty. That's about all we can, can do. Can you hear me now, Doris? Okay, you're, you're my test. If you can hear me, everybody hear me. Um, we have two items for Constitution bylaws today, both of which are in your packet. In fact, one was uh, given to you last month. That's the first one I'd like to address, and that was the, um, the deletion of Robert's Rules of Order and the substitution of what we'll call the Friendship Village Rules of Order. Uh, I gave you a packet with the, the reasoning behind it and some write-ups by independent experts on the whole concept. And Generally speaking, it's... Uh, the theory is you don't use Robert's rules for non-combative organizations. The Democrats and Republicans in Washington could certainly use them, but hopefully we don't have that sort of angst going on in here. At any rate, uh, you've had a chance to review that, and it would be appropriate to move to uh, adopt them, if that's the will of the council, because we have to get it done today. Mm -hmm. we will, we're going we're to take those up after we have committee meetings. We will do that. No business, haven't we talked about this before? Fine. Okay. Have we talked about this before? About the what, on, ongoing. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's come up before, so it will come under old business That's when correct. we do it's a it's motion. Yes, because yeah. I, I, I filed it last week, last yeah. month. The other one is um, um, a proposal from Mike Ivanovich, who is overhauling the whole Constitution bylaws situation, and that's a proposal to add a fifth officer to the executive committee. Um, the point being that it uh, would uh, it'd be a, a position that would be elected at large. It's met with mixed reviews from the committee. About half of the committee are saying not necessary. Uh, one person put it this way, if it ain't, it ain't broken, don't fix it. <laughs> uh, but some of the others, and, and I have to admit, there, there is some attractiveness to having a number on the executive committee that cannot be tied. So, you know, an odd number is a good idea. The other thing I do like about the proposal is that it's at large. All of you folks are um, area reps. This, this would put somebody on the council that's, you know, anybody is, is responsible to everybody. And that's kind of attractive. But 
at any rate, that's, that's up for your decision. Also, that have to be today. And that's all I have to You talk. have, okay. And will you, would you mind hanging around when we get to those motions? I'll certainly hang around. Okay, because we may have questions. Thank sure. you. Are there any questions now, or shall we wait till we get to the motions? Okay, thank, thank you, Marty. Oh, maybe the audience has questions. They may not want to listen to all this, but they need to be here. Okay, thank you. Our next report is from the Dining Committee, Paul McEwen. Good morning. Am I legible, Doors? Okay. Uh, the dining committee uh, had a meeting on October 17. We went through uh, many uh, comment cards. We had over 90. And uh, the nice thing about that is over half of them were positive about the, uh, the operations of the food service here at Friendship Village. And a lot of them had to do with the uh, success of the new salad bar set up. That seemed to, be, to go over very well. Um, there was a, there's still some stuff left over from the previous month uh, when they introduced the new terminal system and people that uh, had uh, what, what's called bingo money. I don't play bingo, so I'm not really that familiar with it, but apparently, uh, the way the bingo money is handled at the terminals is different than the way it used to be. And, uh, and uh, it uh, applies only to dining dollars after the, all the existing dining dollars for somebody's account is exhausted. So uh, uh, what they're looking into is trying to establish a, uh, a gift card uh, that's, that's uh, reloadable, a gift card that can be used in general in the... Uh, in the cafe or in the uh, in the pantry uh, convenience store, and so uh, that'll be announced later when the details get worked out. It's not in yet. Um, there is a there's continuing um, uh, a re a request to have more vegetarian items, and uh, th that is going to happen. They're going to put more vegetarian items into the uh, cafe specials and uh, they'll be uh, in the uh, fireside menus too. In about four weeks, they're going to introduce the, um, what's called the Impossible Burger, and that's a uh, product that is uh, like a hamburger, but it's not meat. It's based on plant products, and apparently it's been successful in, in, uh, in a lot of places. I think Burger King is now offering that as an option in their menus, so that will be coming as, as, a, as a possibility. Uh, in about two weeks, the Thanksgiving menu will be presented, and people are reminded to get there if they want reservations for the Thanksgiving or Christmas uh, dinners, where reservations for multiple people. Uh, you better get them in as early as you can. Uh, for those major dinners, there's usually an appetizer table set up in the lobby area. And uh, from now on, they'll, that appetizer table will be available not only at the lunch or noon meal, but also for the evening meal. Before, it was kind of t all used up by the time the evening meal came. Um, Uh, there's a situation in the cafe with the rotisserie chicken and the ribs that are available in the uh, back wall, I guess you'd say. And uh, they've had a lot of problem with waste because they can't keep those uh, very long. So if they don't get sold, then they have to toss them out. So what they're going to do is ask that those things be pre-ordered so that if you want one, you order it the day before and then it'll be available for pickup between uh, uh, 
eleven thirty and one o'clock the next day. That's for the chicken. And so that'll be on a daily basis during the week. The uh, ribs will only be offered on Wednesday. So if you want the ribs, you want to need to pre-order them at the cafe uh, by five o'clock on Monday. So uh, that's the way that's going to be handled. So that'll avoid a lot of the waste where they've had to throw things out. Um, in the cafe, the holiday gift baskets are will be coming. They're in the works, and so they will be coming. And also, there will be tamales appearing in the freezer case next week. And they're running short on attendance in the cafe right now. There's always a turnover, and uh, so they'll be working on that. Um, in the fireside, there's going to be a new selection of appetizers and salads offered soon, and there will be a, uh, new entrees will be coming up later on. So the new executive chef is working on uh, revising that fireside menu situation. So that will be coming. Uh, on October 28th, which is pretty soon, uh, we will get a new executive sous chef. Finally hired one. His name is Justin Moldenhauer. And he comes from McCormick Ranch, where he was the executive chef there. So we're getting some good people into our dining service. Um, Fireside is getting busy as we get into this season, so you're reminded that uh, to make reservations uh, well ahead of your desired time to have and to make sure you get tables. Tables, larger tables are, are in short supply, so uh, we want to make sure to do that. In the cafe, there's been uh, larger grills ordered to be installed and also what's called a uh, cheese melter. It's like a broiler. And so that certain of the orders will be able to be prepared much, much faster. So that should uh, hold up the delay in the cafe. Should, I mean, should improve the delay times. Um, and that's basically it. Uh, the, 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 the situation with the... Uh, the rotisserie chicken and the ribs, there's an uh, announcement and describing the situation with it back by that is where those things are available. And it'll also be in the villager soon. Yeah. So um, uh, if, you, if you need to know more about that, that's where you go to look at it. And that's the end of my report. Are there any questions from the council? Doris? Um, you know, the, the, the first thing on everybody's mind, except for where they're living, is their food. So whatever you do is very, very important. And I, I think it's extremely important to the residents. And I wonder if we could have more communication. I don't know whether, probably it would have to be from Brian Banks, but it's just a suggestion that we have more communication about what's going on with dining and about changes, uh, new things, you know, n not, not as a critical thing, but just because everybody loves to know more about their food. I, Paul, you could, you could speak with them perhaps about communications they've had food forums but there may be other forums too yes they, they, uh, Brian has a food forum about quarterly I believe mm -hmm. and I'm trying to provide some right. input on that what's coming up sort of thing too so I'm, I'm one of the communication channels with this report and this report is by, by the minutes for the meetings are uh, included in the uh, resident council mm -hmm. uh, group of documents. <laughs> and, and they are published where people can read them if they Th take the right. time to do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, those are always good sources to, to keep track of what's happening with the menu. But also, you know, the, the communication the other way is the comment cards. And uh, those can be done online or, or manually with the comment cards that are posted by the registers. So uh, uh, 
with yeah. 90 of them, I think people are communicating. <laughs> yes, we have another question. You know, perhaps if we got more feedback from the comment cards, people would be more apt to write comment cards. Because most of the time, you know, we submit a comment card or we don't get any feedback, and the general population doesn't get any feedback. So I, I, think, I think we need more communication. Okay, well, I'll mention that to Brian. I do know that if there's a uh, specific instance where there's a complaint, uh, a, a negative report, you might say, that uh, they'll contact the person who submitted that report and, and, and tell them what's going on with that situation. There's a lot of little things like, well, the meat is tough this day, you know, and uh, that kind of a negative report. And, and uh, a lot of times there's explanations for that. But uh, a lot of times they handle that directly themselves. And uh, so I'll, but I'll, I'll mention that to them that uh, that's a desire to have more feedback. Are there any other questions? We have some from the audience. He'll bring you a microphone. Have we eased up on the dress code for the fireside? I was there either last Sunday or two Sundays ago, and four people came in, and one of the gentlemen had on a pair of shorts. And I mean, we sat there and went, uh, nothing was said, there was no explanation in, in there, but have we eased up or do we still have a dress code in the fireside? And what do they do about it when someone comes in with a pair of shorts? There still is a dress code, and as far as I know, it hasn't been eased up. So uh, what happened in that instance, I don't know, but do you know the date? It was either last Sunday or the Sunday before, but I'm not sure. Okay. But it was the gal that was in charge, you know, I, I don't even remember her name. She escorted th this group in with this gentleman, because they went right past the table I was sitting at, and it was like, when have we allowed shorts? And it was a gentleman. I mean, they were very nice looking shorts and he had pretty good looking legs, but, <laughs> but it, we were told from the time we moved in that, that the fireside was this special place that we can go to where we just dress up a little nicer. Right. Perhaps you can look into that, Paul. Thank yeah. you. Uh, there was another question. Uh, Way Paul, in the, following what? up on what Doris said, uh, some of us never look at the villager some of us never look at 1960. Some of us never look at what's posted in the various bulletin boards. So we do need multiple sources of communication. And there are probably people who don't read what they publish from this meeting right. or, or attend the meeting. So we need multiples to cover all of us. Thank you, Ed. We have another question in the back. A couple of them, I guess. Um, I'm wondering what's about the uh, wonderful grill set up at the dog park that doesn't seem to be used. Uh, can we can we use it? Are we going to get some instruction as to how to turn on the gas and all that? That's out of my venue. <laughs> uh, is uh, that activities or that that may be something that uh, needs to? Be, I can. Um, uh, approach that with coal and to find out what the plan is with that. Okay. It's been so hot, I don't think anybody's been interested until now, So, but we can look into that. Thank you for bringing that up. Don't know. Is, is there any plan to bring uh, low fat and 2% milk back? It's been over two oh. weeks I've been going to the store to buy that stuff. Oh, I, I'm, I meant to mention that. I had it written down here to mention that because that, that I heard about that situation after we had our committee meeting. So it didn't, uh, it didn't come up during the committee meeting, but I did check into it. And uh, there was a problem with the vendor. The vendor was just not supplying those milk products. So uh, uh, Brian has uh, uh, negotiated with another vendor, and we're going to start getting the skim, whole milk, and 2% milk starting Saturday, starting tomorrow. And it will be a different vendor. So we'll, we will get those milk products in, uh, in quarts uh, starting tomorrow. 
Okay, good. We have one more question. Go ahead. There you go. Just to emphasize the fact that you need to get your reservations in, I tried to make a reservation for my family on Thanksgiving, and they said there is now a, a significant wait list if you want to come for Thanksgiving. And so I think we're going to feed our kids in the, in the uh, cafe. But certainly, uh, you'll have to hurry to get Thanksgiving, but you certainly want to hurry to get th Christmas. It is my understanding that you can also make reservations for the buffet on holidays. At least we used to be able to do that. So if you can't get there, you might want to check on it. I got a question Yes. Uh, about having to do with the uh, uh, reservations. If you go online, apparently to make your reservations, you get an entirely different answer than if you call on the telephone. That's right. So I don't know what's going on online, but that ought to be checked into. Yeah. Well, you're talking about the... Uh, the, the app on oh, the, Resident yeah. Council. Open, tr open, open table, open he's speaking table, of, yeah. I think. Yeah, I, I've noticed that also. Get closer to the mic. I've noticed that also. Uh, I'll ask the question. Okay, are there any other questions? Yeah. Oh, we have another one, yes. Speak into the microphone. Paul. Hold the button when down. The, uh, when the new cashier system went in, we all of a sudden started seeing tax, tax on some foodstuffs. And since then, and we don't know where that tax money went, the... Uh, Next thing happened was that some of the foodstuffs were being, the price was increased by the amount of tax, but there was not a separate line item on it. What is the situation on that tax collection? Okay, do, uh, what uh, food products were you talking about? The specials? Are you speaking of, in, are in, you speaking of, your dining dollars for meals, or are you talking about the little store? No, dining dollars. Dining dollars for meals for in meals. the cafe. Are there any other questions? We have another one. Yes. I wanted to ask you. Um, I thought that at Fireside, the walkers were supposed to be put in the hall instead of leaving them where people walk into Fireside. And I'm now seeing walkers being kept on, in the area where you walk into the Fireside. Oh, by the uh, reception desk there? Or against the wall? Mm-hmm. And you were saying that it, they should be put where? in the hallway where the uh, restrooms are. That's where I thought that they were supposed oh. to put them. Okay. You have a lot of things to look for, Paul. <laughs> are there any other things you want Paul to take care of? <laughs> okay, thank you, Paul. Everybody likes food. <laughs> our next report is from our election committee. Jay Adler is chairman. Well, not to let Paul walk away. I can tell you firsthand on the fireside when my son and grandson came in with designer jeans on that they got turned away a few years ago. Yeah. And you should have seen what they look like in my trousers because uh, they're 6'6 six, six and 6'3. Six, and, uh, they, but they could come in wearing my trousers with. Even if they look like pedal pushers? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, back on to uh, election. Next week is election. Everybody's got it, gonna have a ballot. We have 13 junior representatives to select, and we have one senior representative who was never elected in the past. Good old Bob. And so you'll see those for procedures. I'm gonna be passing the ballots out to the senior representatives on Sunday morning. It is your responsibility to pass it out to the members within your area. The only exception is none in camp, and that's where the activities director, Jenny Mason, will take care of uh, making sure that it gets to the residents in none in camp. So let me have a little pause. 
are do the representatives have any question on what's going down this Sunday? Um, are you saying that uh, the, the senior reps have to hand out all of them? No, I'm saying the senior rep is responsibility has the responsibility for coordinating with their junior representative, but I'm only passing it out to the seniors. Oh, thank you. Any other questions? That'll be on in that? our mailboxes. Yes, I'll be in the mailboxes Sunday morning. Okay, now let's go through the procedure itself. The election starts Monday morning and runs through noon, noon Friday. At that point, the uh, ballot box that will be located at the reception desks will be picked up. So I'll pick up the box at Nunn Camp. I'll pick up the box over at the reception desk, and the, the elections committee will do the counting, and we will have feedback for the uh, senior representatives and for the council and for the election committee sometime Friday evening. And I'll do that electronically unless you do not have a uh, email account, in which case I will present the results on a matrix. The matrix will show how many ballots were uh, asked for, how many ballots were actually received. They'll show a percentage uh, for the participation for that particular area. If there is a tie, and we have about four areas that have two representatives and one area that has three candidates. Mm -hmm. If there are any ties, those particular areas will have to have a runoff. And we'll discuss that later with those particular area senior reps, if it's appropriate. Um, feedback to, there will be feedback not only to the council, but it'll also be put on the alcove bulletin board. It'll be in the villager as an article of the results, the same matrix of announcing the winners, participation, et cetera. That completes my report unless there are questions. And, and that sounds like we are communicating, like Ed said, in lots of different ways, and people do need to pay attention. Are there, uh, Bob? Uh, we had two candidates, and one had to withdraw for health reasons, so we basically just have one, one person. Do we need ballots? Uh, we're talking Area 7. I got that at a Sunday dinner, and I have removed that person from the ballot. So you still have a ballot for one person. Even though you may have one candidate, you still will have ballots to That's correct. complete. Any other questions? Audience? Ed? Ed? Do you have anything like a quorum if some uh, areas should turn in a very small number of ballots? Um, you will see the results in this matrix that's going to be published, but I can't tell you at this point, since I haven't been the chairman last year, uh, what the predicted results are. I expect participation to be around 50% okay. or higher, but that's a guess at this point. As far as I know, it's not written down anywhere about, about participation. No, but it was something that uh, was recommended by my turnover, and so that's why we're going to do it. Okay. All right. More well, feedback I, for I, people. And the results, but I mean, I don't think it's written anywhere that you have to have a certain number of responses. Is Correct. That right? Yeah. Are there any other questions? Thank you, Jay. We're ready to move on to uh, employee appreciation, and Tom Poole is the chairman of that. Good morning. On behalf of the employees, many thanks to you who have already demonstrated gratitude and appreciation through the team through your gifts. As of Saturday, October 19th, the Employee Appreciation Gift Fund raised $182,423 towards our $360,000 goal. 
So after three weeks of our eight-week fund drive, 51% of the goal has been raised in 38% of the time. Wow, we're just sh slightly ahead of where we were at this time last year. And if you remember, we just made uh, 360,000 last year. Um, as of tomorrow night, Saturday, October 26, four weeks or 50% of the time of the fund drive will have been completed. The results should be available on the board late Sunday evening and cumulative results will continue to be posted late every Sunday evening until the gift fund is over. Uh, the last two weeks of the gift fund, the amount of money that we raise kind of goes down from what we've done prior to that. So we have to kind of build it up so we go down again so we reach our goal. So we appreciate every, everyone uh, coming through. Last year, 2018, we had a lot of new residents and people were here a quarter of a year or a half year and they made gifts accordingly. And we hope that those people will remember that uh, this year they're here a full year and <laughs> will do, do accordingly. Um, the greatest indicator of success in an effort like this is what has happened in the past. Uh, we have a track record at Friendship Village of many successful employee appreciation gift funds. A part of our tradition is that every year a number of village residents wait until the last weeks of the gift fund to make their gift. This generates a good showing of support in the last weeks, enabling us to reach our goal, and works well if we don't forget to make our gift. <laughs> so our committee will remind you we put either a mailbox stuffer or an article in the villager every week, and we're on what I call the electronic bulletin boards. Uh, but if you are comfortable with it, you could gently remind yourselves in each other of the deadline, uh, Saturday, November 23rd, it will help. Um, residents ask if we should concentrate on the size of the gift fund or the size of the gift that we give the 40-hour, 52-week employees. And uh, what I say is this, the amount that is given uh, to the 40-hour employees is influenced to a small extent by the employee retention rate, which we have no control over. Uh, it is more influenced by how much we raise. So we concentrate on the goal of $360,000, which we hope to ex exceed, uh, which we can determine uh, collectively. In general, if we get more, we can do more. Residents uh, often ask, particularly new residents, how to, to determine the amount of their gifts. Please keep in mind that participation and level of participation, it's voluntary. It's whether you want to participate and it's at the level you want to participate as. Also, <clears throat> the purpose of having a gift fund is to keep confidentiality and to have a policy that there is no tipping so that everybody gets the same level of service, but yet we can reward our employees. Uh, so uh, we have one member of the committee, it's not me, who uh, handles the money, takes the money in every night, makes a deposit once a week, uh, and no records of by name are made of any gifts, of who gives what. So we have no records. We maintain confidentiality that way. Uh, annual gifts, if you read in your letter that you got last year, ranged from $1 to $3,500. Every person's financial circumstance is different. There are several methodologies, and people keep asking me about how to determine the amount of their gift. So here goes. The average gift is not a good way to do it. Not everybody gives for any organization, particularly the one this large. The percentage of participation here 
is very high. If we count how many envelopes that we put out in independent living in a nunning camp, and then we count how many envelopes after the checks have been taken out back, the treasurer counts how many envelopes come back in, we have about 80% participation. That's very high. But not everybody gives, and if you're thinking of an average, you can't think of everybody in that average. Also, if you take the largest gift and the smallest gift uh, and try to average that, the $3,500 and the $1 gift, uh, that's $1,750.50, and that's not a very meaningful uh, average. And what if there are 50 people during a year who give $1? What does that do to the average? So average in any kind of a fundraising effort is not really a good way uh, to look at things. Better ways to determine the amount of gift may be, and there's other ways than the ways I'm going to mention, uh, but one resident last year um, told me that since the largest gift in 2017, 2017 was $3,000, according to his level, that he thought that one-third of the residents might be wealthier than he was, so he would give $2,000 in 2018. Well, I hope the same resident will use the same methodology um, <laughs> and see that the largest gift in 2018 was $3,500 and would consider giving $3,367 in 2019. Uh, but that's one methodology, that's persons. Others is the way of uh, you take a percentage of the meal costs. Uh, say, for example, uh, we all have $11 a day times 365 days, and you take a percentage. Many people look at 10% or 15%, and then they add something in for their housekeeper. Uh, and then they add something in for their tram driver and their security guard and other people who serve them and determine the amount of the gift that way. Uh, and, you know, there, you can use a lot of different percentages, but that's the way that they determine. Um, there are several ways to do it. The best way is what makes you feel good. You know, it's up to you. It's your individual choice. It's confidential. No one knows. What makes you feel good? And we always say, give a check your heart can cash. Uh, the employee checks will be distributed on Friday, December 6th in the Skirm Auditorium here, as we do every year. Come join us at this time of celebration and joy for residents and employees. If you cannot come to the Skirm for the trek check presentation celebration, please join us on channel 1960 for the live telecast. The no November 23rd deadline for the gift fund is timed so that the gift checks can be distributed to the employees at the beginning of the holiday season. So they will have the funds to, uh, uh, to spend on that. Uh, the donation box will be out there at 8 p.m. on Saturday the 23rd. Uh, the Employee Appreciation Gift Fund is the only measurable way to show the employees every year how much we care. So uh, hope that we do well, we we'll keep our fingers crossed, and I thank you very much for what we've done already. Thank you, Tom. Are there any questions from the council? Any questions from the audience? I guess you covered it all, thank you. We do have, that is not listed on the agenda, we do have a report from the Health Services Committee. Doris Gazda is giving the report for Richard Brown. I'm giving this report um, in place of Richard Brown, who is the chair of the committee. 
After a summer off, the Health Services Advisory Committee has jumped back into action with two final events, both scheduled for Tuesday, November 5th. Our well-received forum on admissions and accounting will be presented for the fourth time in 2019 on that day, and the annual tour of Nunnenkamp will be done also on that day. Sign-up sheets for both events will be available beforehand. At our October meeting, a very interesting presentation was made by Mary Beth Gallagher, Director of Dementia Services for Hospice of the Valley. She and Gail Higginbotham of Hospice demonstrated their toolbox of ways to communicate with patients in nonverbal advanced dementia. Using such things as music, poetry, feathers, fur, yarn, scented lotion, lifelike baby doll, or animated pets, they can make contact with patients through the five senses, touch, hearing, sight, taste, smell. Members of the Friendship Village Dementia Crew were also present. This, this report is submitted by Richard Brown, the chairman. Are there any questions that Doris may be able to ask her? Hearing none, thank you, Doris. I believe that concludes our committee reports for today. We have some old business, and the first one on that is the final discussion of the motion for the Roberts Rules of Order change. And this uh, should be the one that has the red draft in the corner, I believe. Is this the change of order? Yes. No, that's not that one. It's the other one. Which one is it? Well, then, what if that's that? What's the purported order of business change? Oh, never mind. I think that we must be. I'm going. To, what I'm going to do is let you read, and maybe some of you already have. You need to check over the page that reads Constitution and Bylaws, Article Six, Election of Council Members and Officers. Um, Marty, am I clear on this is the one that would add a person to the executive committee? That's correct. The, um, the, the one that uh, deals with yes. the change in the... Yes. And, and so all of these things, the changes are just the formality of doing that? Correct. That's a, what we call a red line version. Uh, okay. Shows what's been and, deleted and what's been added. And I don't know whether it lists what the executive committee does in the... Constitution and bylaws? Uh, there's no change to what the committee yeah. does. Yeah, and what I, it does. The, the executive committee really uh, approves the agenda. Uh, we do not make any major um, decisions. It is not the duty of the president, vice president, treasurer, and secretary to make major decisions. That's up to the council. But it is conceivable that something could come up yes, between meetings and when the council is not available, and you might need to rely on the executive committee to then have it ratified by the full council at the next meeting. That's true, and also there could be something that may be questionable about putting on the agenda, which was mostly what the executive council does. Correct. So you need to think about that for a minute and, and decide where you feel about it. And Marty, did you want to speak to that? To uh, that motion, there's no, no nothing more. I think I spoke to it already. It's a, okay. it's not a bad idea. Nobody's uh, is okay. saying that we shouldn't do it. We're just saying, that, as I say, some people feel that it isn't broken, so don't fix it. Uh, I I, I kind of like the idea of an at-large representative, but once again, now, it's not, this not vital. this person at large would not be a member of the council. It would be anyone from the village. Is that? My oh, yes, anybody yeah. at large from the, yes. It, yeah, could be elected from anywhere in the village, does not have to be a council member. Correct. The and by other, the way, that, that has been reviewed by the Elections yeah. Committee, too, so. The, 
the other members of the executive board are have been council members. That's correct. Um, but this one would not have to have been a council member. Right. Okay. Do we have any questions? Do you understand what we're doing? Maybe we don't need to Keep take. Keep in mind, we have two time. things going on here. One, one item is the uh, change of the rules of order. The second that, item is the. Yeah, I think uh, we officer. have that next. A proposed okay. order of change, and we'll, yeah. but well, let's do the first one. Sure. Um, do we have any questions about this first one of adding a person to the? That's not the first one. Okay, then I'm confused. Final discussion and motion for the rules change was the first the rule one. Rule changes, right. and where where do the, which one are those? I hadn't hadn't gotten these. This one is the proposed order of business change, isn't that's it? That's correct. Yeah, this is the second item. Well, that's really. That was submitted last month, Mary, for action this month. Well, then I, when, does, when do the one about the fifth one come up? I don't know. That was submitted today for action. Oh, today. that will have to be a new one? Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm all right. Then so it is this one with the list. Now, I did know that somebody had something to say about, I think, the list. Did I have someone with a suggestion? Bob, did you want to talk to that? You have to use your microphone. Where I'm sorry, I I thought we were talking about the first per, that the first item is about the rules of order change. I'm sorry, I misunderstood that. Okay, uh, Bob, what, did you what want is to the Bob what is Hour wanted to speak to that? Okay, well I'm a little confused too because doesn't says. Robert's rules change. Do we have a separate piece of paper for that? No. Or is that something? That was. That was that was submitted last month. Right. Yeah, Bob. that was a motion made last month. Which was to not use Robert's rules of order and yes. to use these new rules and lieu thereof. So, do we need to vote on that? Yes. Vote on what? What do you mean, Bob? On abandoning Robert's rules of order and establishing a new Friendship rule Village of order. order. Friendship Village rule of order. Did, did we vote on that last time? No, we discussed it. We discussed it, but we did not vote on it. So we need to vote, is what you're saying, we need to vote on the change and right. then vote on whether that's well, the change Well, it seems we like want. before we go to point number two, we need to take care of point number one. Okay, that's what my understanding is. So our vote would be on whether or not to change Robert's rules of order, and so it is proposed that we do change, then the next thing would be looking at the order of business. Bob Helmbold has a question, a comment. Uh, first of all, let me say that the idea of moving away from Robert's rules of order, I'm very much in sympathy with that. Uh, the point that Robert's Rules of Order are too heavy, too formal, too elaborate for to fit uh, the purpose and intents of our organization, I absolutely agree with that. Okay, so you're saying you agree with changing... However, uh, no. I want to suggest two changes to the motion here. One is uh, motivated by the idea that this gives enormous powers to the chair, if it's interpreted literally. In the hands of our current chair, that doesn't bother me in the least. But in looking forward to future years, we may have a chair who for reasons that I don't understand, wishes to impose their will on everything. And now perhaps it's uh, intended to be understood without needing mention. Nevertheless, I would like to add at the end of the second paragraph, after the end of the second paragraph, something that reads, However, 
All points of order. Appeals for decision of the chair. Or motions to suspend the rules shall be in order. Now the purpose of that is to provide the council with the mechanisms for providing a check on the chair. As I said, mm -hmm. perhaps it was intended that this be understood without mentioning, but I think it needs to be put down in writing because not all members of the current or future council will be aware of the availability of these checks on the chair. That's one point. I have one other point. Uh, in paragraph three, it says that uh, actions of the council shall be approved by a majority of the quorum. Well, the quorum presently is only 13 council members and the majority of that quorum would be only seven council members. Now, I don't think that a motion that's approved by seven council members and vehemently disapproved, disapproved by six council members uh, should be considered of, as passed. Therefore, instead of saying that it shall be uh, approved by an affirmative vote of the majority of the quorum present, I would like it to read by receiving an affirmative vote of the majority of the council. Now, a majority of the council presently would be 14 council members. I think that's a good change to be made. So those two points I would move be incorporated into this rules of order. If I may comment on that. The first point that Bob raises, um, my answer to that is be careful who you elect. I don't think we have any New York real estate developers with blonde hair running around here. Uh, but you know, I that, that's really I, the I, issue. We didn't hear that, Marty. The issue is who, who, is, who you're gonna elect. I said, I don't believe there are any blonde-headed real estate developers from New York running around here. But nonetheless, I suppose something could happen. The answer is be careful about who you elect. Um, uh, there's no need for fancy points of order and all that stuff. It's just not necessary. You're not, you're not an antagonistic body. You're a consensual body. And yet that gives a lot of power to the chair, but the chair is a, <laughs> kind of a, a short-term uh, uh, device anyway. And uh, uh, just don't elect somebody that you don't trust. But there has been a motion to make those additions. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. I'll second. Okay. Then um, we will have to have a vote. It's been moved and seconded that we add those changes. We, is there some discussion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the second point that he made about a majority of the council is worthy of being thought about because, and I don't know what you, what, what you think. Uh, I, I think that you've already established what you have for a quorum, and what you're effectively doing is changing that. Well, it says a majority of the quorum. So yeah, but if, but if, the, if quorum is 13, is that what it is, Bob? Then would it be just six people could make a decision? No, it would have Seven. to be eight. Would seven at least seven? Yeah, but I mean to say that it has to be a majority of fourteen. You know, you're just artificially changing the quorum. Yeah, which no, if you want to do that, that's fine. But no, yeah. a majority of the council. He was changing the wording yeah. to the by, council. By the majority of the council. You already you have a provision that the council can do business with less than a majority of the council being here, with only thirteen members. That's that's what the quorum rule is all about. So if you want to change that, that's fine, but I, I'd prefer to change it in the quorum section rather than mess around with mm -hmm. dangling uh, changes to this particular clause. Is there any other discussion to this motion? We're going to Madam need to... Chairman, I'm... Oh, um, Bob? I'm, I think I'm a fairly clear-headed thinker, and I'm confused enough now that can we table this until next time no. and have this in writing? 
what's being discussed because this is like it's getting bad and mm -hmm. back and forth, mm -hmm. and I'm not exactly sure what's being proposed I, I, here. Well, Bob, that's why I gave it to you guys last month. Uh, the problem yeah. is if we don't yeah. do it, if we don't do it, this this today is the window because it has to go from here to the uh, to the association, uh, the association meeting. meeting. And it has to be but amendments are being suggested that I'm not even sure exactly what's being suggested and what's being seconded. Um, what is your pleasure? I, Bob, we've heard from Bob. Do we hear Sandy? Well, the first thing, the first thing we need to have a motion to vote on is whether or not we keep Robert's rules of order. And then the second thing we've just been discussing is number two, which is do we accept the new rules? You're not I'm sorry. Not close enough. Not close enough? Okay. Yeah, there you go. So the first thing is that was up was do we have a motion to drop Robert's rules of order? And then the second thing was do we have a motion to adopt the new rules of order? I think that's two, mo two motions, don't you think, Mary? We already have those, don't we, from the last, from our last meeting? No. Okay. I don't think we, we, no, we, never, we didn't no vote on Robert's Rules We didn't vote on, last okay. Time. No. So we That's need to Bob's vote on Robert's Rules of Order. The, the idea was to give you folks a, a month to look at it. So what you're saying, Sandy, is we need to mo vote on the Robert Rules of Order first? Yes. So yes. what our motion is then that we will no longer use Robert's rules of order. Is that correct? Is that the motion? That's yes. Right. That works. And we are, do we ha we've had a second to that? I second. Okay. Is there any discussion on that? Are we ready for the, for the vote? Uh, uh, Bob? Again, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm confused here because we mentioned Robert's rules of order here as one of the resources that the chair can, can use. So are we saying? Well, Bob, the, the, uh, the current bylaws provide that Robert's Rules controls everything. This does away with that. And I'm sure you can use Robert's Rules as a resource. Huh? There's no problem with that, but it's not a mandatory. So the motion should really be Robert's Rules will no longer be the controlling rule of order for everything. That's correct. As, as a matter of fact, I think it's set up with the section that it be, be stricken and replaced. So are we ready for a vote? We better vote by hands because I'm not sure we uh, can do it by voice. Could you, re could you repeat again what we're voting on, please? The first motion is that we no longer use Robert's Rules of Order as our guiding document. Is that how you refer to that? Order of the order. Yeah, rules of okay, order. and there's been a second to that motion. All those in favor of doing away with Robert's Rules of Order, please raise your hand. Well, that, that looks like uh, almost um, uh, unanimous, not quite. Are there any opposed? Well, I guess it is unanimous. Okay, now we've done away with that. Right. Our next step then is to, I'm not sure. Where are we, Marty? Well, we have... In that motion, we proposed a replacement for the Roberts rules, which is we, I call the friendship village rules. Okay. Which are there. They are presented on, mm -hmm. oh, okay. And Bob so, wants to amend paragraph two. Is it paragraph two, Bob, you want to amend? And that's in, still in this thing? Okay. This is still on the paper with the draft. So we're talking about one, two, and three. Not, we're not talking about the order yet, right? Right, well, the order, I think, is... Is part of it? Yeah, it's part of it, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, so that's, the order would be part of that. Bob. That's the area that I want to speak to, because when I look at the order, um, I don't understand why the committee reports are behind the action items, old business and new business, because it seems to me that the committee reports uh, often result in new business and action items that need to be voted on. And if they are all the way at the end of the meeting and there's items that need to be voted on, we've already done action items in point three. So why, why are committee, can someone tell me why committee reports are so far down the line? I don't, I was surprised at that too. I did not see that 
um, I was not present when they made that uh, order of business. Marty, you want to speak to that? Or so, are there any other members on the council that are on your committee, Marty? Maybe they could speak to that too. The order of business now, is that up there? Can you get it up there? No, I have the first three. Oh, the first three. Um, that particular one is modified the way you want it. The order on your paper reads the welcome and that would be by your president, I assume, the administration report, action items, old business, new business, committee reports, call to constituents, announcements, and adjournment. Um, what Bob is saying is that he thinks the committee report should come before action, old, and new business so that if anything is generated from that, can be handled with old and new business. I have no problem with that. These are very flexible. Does anybody else have an opinion on that? Are you making a motion? Oh, um, it, Bev? It, well, it does say, unless the president determines otherwise, meetings are as follows. So, Well, but if we're going to be doing, uh, in my opinion, if we're going to be doing it every month, we might as well make it the way it, that it would be happy with everybody. I'm probably not supposed to give an opinion, but uh, Sandy. Okay, so what you're saying is that number six committee reports would move on the list up to number three mm -hmm. following the administration report. Yes. And everything else stays Everything the else same. would move down one, one slot. That's fine. Okay. Okay, are you making that as a, oh, we have a question down here? Um, I don't know why we even need this because I think what the way we're doing it now is perfect. So I don't understand why this is important to even change. Well, then that that's what we're talking about. So you have, okay, has this been put into a motion? I have a question. Sandy, is this an emotion? It will, it, well, it was on to be an emotion, but I have a question. You have a question. Marty, can you explain what call to constituents is? Yeah, that's a, that's a provision that it's not mandatory, but I, I've used it a lot uh, uh, with bodies where there is a, lo a large audience, like a, a planning and zoning board, something like that. And that's simply a call, an opportunity for anybody who wants to speak to speak, anybody in the audience. And normally what you do is you give them a slip of paper and they put their name on mm -hmm. it and what they want to talk about, give it to the secretary mm -hmm. and they get three minutes at the end of the meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not a mandatory, just a bell and whistle. Okay, so it's my understanding that we have not had a motion yet. So I think we need to have a motion from someone so that we can move on. Madam Chairman, there, there is a motion on the floor that's been made and seconded that somehow it'd be nice if we could see it up on the screen, but it, it has to do with paragraph two and paragraph three. Mm -hmm. um, even before we're talking about this mm -hmm. order down below. So I, unless that motion is going to be withdrawn, that needs to be, I think, dealt with first. Well, the, the proper order is we should have a motion to adopt the, the rules. Then... The new rules. The new rules. Then we can talk about amendments to that motion. And then we have to change them after we've had that. Is well, that what you're telling me? Well, once we get a motion in a second. I'll make a motion. Rules. I'll make a motion to adopt the new rules of order. Okay, and is, there a second? is there a second? second? Thank you. There's a second. No. It has moved. Under discussion. Is there any amendment? And seconded that we adopt the new rules. Now we can have a discussion. Can we change those within that motion? Do we have to have another motion if we change the order? No, you don't need another motion. The, 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 if, we, if we agree to amend something, it's, the motion is as amended to approve the uh, adoption of the new rules as amended. As amended. So we can amend those first? Correct. Okay, so, what, so before we go on with the, with the vote for the whole rules, do we want to rearrange the order of business. Well, and include Bob's comments. And what we're looking at is include Bob's amendments. Bob's 
amendment. Well, that would be the change of the of the order, right? That is your Here's amendment. Two and three. Oh, Bob's rules. <laughs> yeah, too many Bobs. <laughs> so we need to put the ones that Bob moved in with that too. Then Marty, I'm let's looking to you for parliamentary. Let's stuff. take it one step at a time. First, let's deal with with Bob Helmholtz. Um, we're going to do changes. Bob Hubboat's motion first, yeah. and that would be to add those things to item two and three. And the, the things being, Bob, you want to point the, the order? So, Bob Hemble, you made a motion to add to items three, two and three, right? I did. I did. I'll repeat the but, uh, motion. I... Uh, I don't think you need to repeat the motion. I think everybody understood that. We need to vote on that now, right? Mary, I'd we like to second. hear them again. Hmm? I'd like to hear uh, them again. Yes, read them again, please, then. You've been asked to read them again. The motion is to add at the end of paragraph two. However, all points of order, appeals for, from the decision of the chair, or to suspend the rules shall be in order. The purpose of those is to provide the council, if necessary, a mechanism to correct the action of the chair or to rein in the actions of the chair should it become necessary to do so. Okay, and then can, what was the other one on item three? Item three would be to revise item three. Instead of reading by an affirmative vote of the majority of the quorum present, to read an affirmative vote of the majority of the council members. Does everybody understand the changes? Are there any questions about the changes? Mary. Mary. Uh, Katie. I, I think they're two separate items, and I think they should be addressed as two, two separate items. That the first being about. Suspension of the rules and points of order. Right. I, I think that, that should be one vote, and that point number three should be a second That's to correct. see where we're going with it. Yeah. Do we need a motion for that? Okay, we, the first one is. The, uh, uh, can we just vote on that separately without making a motion, or do we need no, another motion? We can, we can uh, move. I will, I will, I will simply concede the point and make a separate okay. action. All right. Then we're ready for a vote, I think, on item two, two that he had made the addition to, All and that would be to keep track of what the chairman's doing and doesn't do anything they're not supposed to, in essence. Uh, all those in favor of the change to item second? number two, Mary, please you raise second? your hand. Do you have a second? Yes, we had a second originally, yeah. Okay, we have two. Uh, wait a minute, hold them up again. I can't see uh, one. We're, we're voting on the change to item number two, which would be show a little restriction to the chairman. Please hold them up again so we can count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How many do we have present? But we do have a majority of the quorum, which is the way it stands right now. So that is passing. Now we are ready for item number three, and this is... Isn't that item three that we yeah, had? It? Don't we ask for the number of no's on that? Oh, we do ask, need to ask for the number of no's. Thank you, Sandy. I've, uh, since it was more than half, I didn't ask. Are there any no's to item number two? Okay, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. I think we, uh, some people voted four and against. Uh, I think you're right. We are voting, I'm sorry, I'm not being clear because it's all very confusing to me as well as to you. Item number two, we are voting on the change, to the restriction, I guess would be called. We need to vote again because some people, I think, voted twice. 
All those in favor of the change to number two, please hold your hand up. All those opposed to the change to number two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I got ten on that one. So it is not, it is defeated. Correct. Our next item is item number three, and this would be about the quorum and making it a quorum of the, I should say, a majority of the council and not a majority of a quorum. Is that correct? Am That's I interpreting correct. that properly? You're interpreting correctly. I, I, my point being that if you want to change your definition of a quorum, you ought to do it in the section that sets out what your quorum is. Well, That's the quorum is already there, right? Yeah, it's 13. Yeah, we already know it's what the quorum 13. is. Yes, it's 13. Yeah, and that's what you said is that's what you're gonna do business with. 13 members is fine. But now you're changing this to say that it, that it mm -hmm. has to be a super majority. Yeah. But the, but the motion was to just change it to the majority of the quorum, of the council. Council. Council members, which would be and, and 14. My point is that if you want to do that, change the quorum. Don't change 